it's time to learn about the binomial theorem. This is one of the most interesting and beautiful results in mathematics, and it's also going to be super useful. Everyone wins. You've seen that often we like to look at quantities that look like x plus h. Sometimes x plus h squared, we saw that in the previous example. Why do we want this? It's because this appears in quantities like our definition of the derivative. We have an x plus a very small quantity, h. We want to know how to expand that to higher powers, like x plus h cubed, x plus h to the n with an arbitrary exponent. Today's theorem was proven by Isaac Newton for a rational exponent that didn't even have to be an integer, but could be any fraction, but today we're going to stick to integers. We need expressions like this to find out what's the derivative of x to the n. Why would I want to do that? Well, if I can make a rule for any polynomial function, then I don't have to do work. I can just follow the rule. Spoiler alert. The derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. We are going to prove this by the end of this video. Suppose we have the quantity x plus h squared. We know this is x plus h times x plus h. We've already seen that that's x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. How did we get that? It was x times x plus x times h plus h times x plus h times h. We have two hx's, an hx and an xh, and an x squared and an h squared. What if we look at the higher power? x plus h times x plus h times x plus h. We can save ourselves some work by looking at what we've already done. This is x plus h times x plus h squared. That's x plus h times our trinomial expression, x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. Let's multiply it out. x times x squared is x cubed. x times 2hx is 2hx squared. x times h squared is h squared x. Repeating this, multiplying through by the h, we have three more terms. Let's combine the terms of like color, which are also alike in their number of h's and number of x's, we see we have x cubed plus 3hx plus 3h squared x plus h cubed. To make more meaning of this, let's remind ourselves what multiplication really means. Suppose I have a line 6 units long and another line 3 units long. I want to know how big this rectangle is. We all know it's 3 times 6. What does this mean? It means I have 18, but what does that mean? It means I have six groups of three. Is there another way to look at this? It also means I have three groups of six. So three times six is six times three. But what if I don't know what the numbers are? They just have names like a and b. Then the area is a times b, which of course is the same as b times a. Suppose we have a nice square. If the sides of my square are c, and of course c, then the area is c times c, which we also call c squared. What if I don't know what c is, but it's equal to a plus b, and a plus b? Then the area of my square must be a plus b times a plus b, or a plus b squared. But what does this mean? Can we find a geometric insight? Let's split the square into parts. I see that this square is equal to a squared. This square has an area b squared. What does that leave us? Two rectangles. Their areas are a times b and b times a. Adding that up, we see what we already knew. a squared plus ab plus ba plus b squared gives me a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Or 1a squared plus 2ab plus 1b squared. What do those represent? A big square, two sticks, and a little square. What does this look like in higher dimensions? Here's a cube. Its dimensions are a plus b times a plus b times a plus b. Let's break it up to see what's inside. Moving out the little cube, I have three rods, three slabs, and a big cube. Let's make some more space. What did this look like when it was just a times b to the 1? It was 1a and 1b. a plus b to the 1 gives me 1a plus 1b. a plus b squared, we have 1a, two sticks, 1a squared, 2ab sticks, and 1b squared square. With a plus b cubed, we have a big cube, three slabs, three rods, 
and a little cube. It looks like something's missing from this pattern. Ooh. We forgot a plus b to the 0. We know any number to the 0 is 1. This looks like a pattern we've seen before. Let's look at just the coefficients. We can see that each number in the triangle is equal to the sum of the two numbers above it. 1 plus 1 gives us 2. 1 plus 2 gives us 3. 2 plus 1 gives us 3. What should the next row look like if we continue 1's on the outside? 1 plus 3 gives us 4. 3 plus 3 gives us 6. 3 plus 1 gives us 4. This is called Pascal's triangle. Does the pattern continue when we multiply polynomials? Let's see. Suppose we have x plus h to the fourth. We can write this as x plus h times x plus h cubed. Multiplying this through, we have x to the fourth plus 3hx cubed plus 3h squared x squared plus h cubed x. Repeating the procedure, we can combine like terms and see that we have 1x to the fourth, 4hx cubed, 6h squared x squared, 4h cubed x, and 1h to the fourth. This is indeed what we found in the table. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, using Pascal's triangle. This is much faster than multiplying. 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. What else could these coefficients mean? Let's see. How many ways can we arrange x's and h's? If I have four x's, there's only one way. x, 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 x. But if I have three x's and an h, the h could be last, third, second, or first. There are four ways to arrange three x's and an h. Similarly, there are six ways to arrange two x's and two h's listed here. Which one I call h and which one I call x is kind of arbitrary, so of course I get a symmetric pattern on the other side. There are four ways to arrange three h's and one x. And of course, there's only one way to have four h's. This reminds me of something else that we can arrange. Pennies. Suppose I have four pennies and want to know how many ways can I have zero tails. One way. This is it. What if I want to know how many ways I can have one tail? It could be this one, this one, this one, this one. There are four ways to have one tail. Of course, this means there are four ways to have three heads, so there should also be four ways to have three tails. This way, this way, this way, this way. What if I have two heads and two tails? Well, I could look at how many ways can I pick two of the coins to be tails. This way, this way, three, four, five, six. There are six ways to have two tails with four coins. What if we have more coins? We need a more advanced method. It's time for advanced counting. Suppose I have 10 pennies. Let's count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I want three of them to be tails. This one, this one, and this one, say. But how many ways could I have had three tails with 10 pennies? Well, there are 10 choices for my first tail. But I've already chosen one, so there are only nine choices for my second tail. That leaves eight pennies I could choose from for the third tail. But have I overcounted? I think I have. Any of those three that I chose could have been chosen first. That leaves two that could have been chosen second. So we need to divide by three and divide by two. And the last one is already determined, but we can write the one there because it looks nice. So we have the number of coins times one less than that times one less than that divided by the number of tails times one less than that times one less than that until we get to one. Is there a better way to write this? Let's see. I have 10 times 9 times 8 over 3 times 2 times 1. I'd like to continue this pattern times 7 times 6 times 5, times 4, times 3, times 2, times 1. But I can't just multiply the top of a fraction. That changes the value. So let's multiply the bottom, too. Times 7, times 6, times 5, times
times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. I can see that I've just multiplied by 1. But now we can write this as 10 factorial divided by 3 factorial times 7 factorial, which happens to be the number of coins factorial times the number of tails factorial times the number of coins minus the number of tails factorial. or the number of coins factorial times the number of tails factorial times the number of heads factorial. Let's make that clearer with the symbols. If I have n coins and k tails, the number of ways I can arrange them is often denoted by the number of ways I can choose n things taken k at a time. So this is n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. But these numbers are just the coefficients of our multiplied polynomial. Another symbol used for the combination of n things taken k at a time is this bracket symbol. If you want to know where to find this function on, our, on your calculator, it's under the stat button. This gives us a compact way to write x plus h to the fourth. We have four symbols chosen zero at a time, there's just one way to do that, plus how many ways can I choose one h out of four symbols, x, 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 h. There are four ways, remember? There were six ways to choose two tails out of four coins, four ways to choose three heads. And there's only one way to have all four symbols be heads, or all four symbols be h's. Now we have a rule for any number n. So x plus h to the n is n choose 0, x to the n, h to the 0, plus n choose 1, x to the n minus 1, h to the 1, etc. The pattern is the top of the combinatorial factor is always n the power we're raising to. The number chosen at a time, the bottom number, starts at 0 and increases up to n in each additional term. The exponent of x starts at n and decreases until we reach 0. x to the 0 is just 1. And the exponent of h starts at 0 and increases up to n. So the powers of x are decreasing and the powers of n are increasing. Using sigma notation, then we can write x plus h to the n is the sum from k equals 0 to n of n choose k, x to the n minus k, h to the k. Where, of course, our bracketed symbol represents the number of ways to choose n things taken k at a time.